Welcome to the Healthy Living Revolution Live. My name is Wendy Erdman. The Healthy Living Revolution is a movement of people who are taking healthy back. And we're offering this series to bring some simple solutions and education. Our speaker for this episode is cardiologist, Dr. Eric Golder. Dr. Golder is a board certified cardiologist and the founder of the Heart Attack and Stroke Prevention Center of Central Ohio. He grew up in Central Ohio and then graduated from the Oberlin College. He graduated from the Ohio State University College of Medicine and then did his internal residency and his cardiology fellowship at Riverside Methodist Hospital. He is board certified in internal medicine and in cardiovascular disease. Dr. Golder has practiced what he would now call standard of care or end stage cardiology for 20 years here in Central Ohio, and then for the last 12 years in Marietta, Ohio. During that time period, he practiced general and invasive cardiology. After being introduced to the bail donine method of heart attack and stroke prevention, he has since devoted his practice full time to a preventative approach to cardiovascular disease. The Heart Attack and Stroke Prevention Center has, of Central Ohio has been open for a little over a year and a half and is a collaboration between Dr. Golder and his wife, Dr. Barb McClatchy. Their mutual goal is to knock cardiovascular disease off the top of the list as the leading killer in our country, where it has been for over 100 years. Together, Dr. Golder and Dr. McClatchy enjoy touring on their motorcycle they have crisscrossed the country from Bar Harbor, Maine to Key West, Florida, and west to the national parks in Utah and up to Yellowstone. While they are technically empty nesters now, their two golden retrievers help to liven up the house. It's a privilege now to turn it over to Dr. Golder. Thank you, Wendy, for that kind introduction. We're going to talk today about how we can make heart attacks optional, and we want to you to join us in our mission, which is helping to knock cardiovascular disease off that top rung of the ladder where it's been as the leading killer in this country for the past hundred years. We want to help you take healthy back. So what are the statistics of heart attacks and strokes? So heart attacks remain the number one killer in this country as they have been since 1919. Someone has a heart attack every 40 seconds in our country. Somebody dies from a heart attack every minute. The average age for a man for a heart attack is 65 and for a woman is 72. So just when you get to that point in your life where you're going to kick back a little bit, relax, spend more time with the kids and grandchildren and travel more, get struck down by a heart attack or a stroke. The median survival for men having a first heart attack over the age of 45 is only eight and a half years. And for women, it's only five and a half years. And it's the largest cause of premature uh, loss of life. That's seven, an average of 17 years. So what about strokes? It's very similar to heart attacks. It's the leading uh, cause of disability in this country. Somebody has a stroke every 40 seconds. Somebody dies from a stroke every four minutes. Over 2,300 people in this country die from cardiovascular disease every day. And if you've ever been to Washington, D.C. and seen the Vietnam Memorial Wall, you know there's 58,000 men and women on that wall. And every three and a half weeks, 58,000 people in this country die from cardiovascular disease. Every three and a half weeks, we go through a Vietnam War worth of death, and then we do it again. So what are the classic risk factors for cardiovascular disease? Well, you know these. It's high blood pressure, diabetes, cholesterol, tobacco smoke. And these were all developed from the Framingham study that we're going to talk about a little, a little bit later. But um, if we just take one of these risk factors, and that's diabetes and obesity, and look at what's happened to this country over the past 20 years, these are CDC slides of uh, obesity and diabetes by state in this country. And we're going to click through this, uh, these maps very quickly, and you can see that we're going from relatively healthy to relatively sick very quickly in this country. Uh, over the, past, over the next 20 years, we're almost there. It's, there's a, now that's 2014, here's 2015. And if you compare this slide now to where the deaths occur in this country, or compare it to the beginning uh, slide, you can see that we've gone from being relatively healthy to relatively sick and, and a great deal more diabetes in this country. The CDC map by county of where deaths occur in this country by cardiovascular disease is very similar to the bottom slides. So we know that Juice Plus improves insulin resistance. There's a CDC report out that states that there are 28 and a half million people in this country with diabetes who know it and are being treated. There are another 100 million people in this country who either have 
uh, insulin resistance or diabetes don't know it and it's not being treated. 100 million people, that's almost a third of the country, uh, has either insulin resistance or diabetes. So a heart attack or, or sudden cardiac death is the presentation for half the cases of coronary disease. Really the lucky people are the ones that get symptoms or uh, see their doctor and get a stress test done and find out they've got a problem and get treated for it. The other half of the cases, it's either a heart attack or just dropping over dead. So here's several people that we all know. Uh, David Letterman, the uh, old Tonight Show host, had a heart attack and five vessels, five vessel bypass surgery. He was only 52 years old. James Gandolfini, the uh, lead actor of The Sopranos, had a heart attack and died at age 52. John Candy, uh, the uh, comedian in many films, and and had a heart attack and died at age 43. Bob Harper, the celebrity personal trainer, had a heart attack at age 52. And here's probably the most ironic of the bunch, uh, Dr. John Warner. He's the immediate past president of the American Heart Association. Uh, he was at the big American Heart Association annual meeting in November uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, he came back up from uh, his spin class at uh, 6.30 in the morning and dropped over dead in the hotel room. Fortunately, his family was there. His daughter, his daughter had been trained in some uh, uh, non-breathing CPR. Uh, and uh, he got resuscitated and survived. And we're gonna talk about him a little bit more toward the end of this talk. So here, that begs the question, why do people not know that they have arterial disease? All these people had arterial disease and they had it for years before they had an event and nobody knew. Well, here's what a normal artery, coronary artery looks like. It's got a thin one cell thick lining layer here called the endothelium. And this is not to, we used to think it was just a lining la layer, but it's actually uh, plays an uh, plays an active role in, um, in controlling uh, blood flow to your arteries. Uh, there's a, uh, another thin layer here called the, called the endothelium. Okay, cut. Cut. Start right there. I'm good. Sure. Mm -hmm. okay. There's another thin layer right here called the intima. This is where all the bad things happen in the artery. And then there's a muscle layer and then the outer arterial wall, which is fibrous connective tissue and elastic tissue. And so if we look at a picture of what goes on in the arteries, this uh, crusty old blockage, all this stuff here, this is all calcification, scarring, fibrosis, collagen, all this stuff happened in this thin little layer right here. And this is about an 80% blockage. This is all that's left of what we call the lumen or the opening where the blood flow goes through. And that's, this is a very stable old blockage. It's probably not going to go anywhere. Nothing bad is going to happen to it probably. On the other hand, this, this blockage over here is probably about a 25% blockage of this arterial wall. There's no calcification here. This is all full of cholesterol and the inflammatory response to the cholesterol getting into that lining layer, which is white blood cells and proteolytic enzymes, enzymes that can dissolve proteins and kill bacteria. And it's just covered by this thin fibrous cap right here. Here's that blow up of that thin fibrous cap. And these proteins in here, in, in the, in the, I'm sorry, these enzymes in here can dissolve this thin fibrous cap and that's what can cause the artery to rupture. So the next question is, how bad is the blockage before a heart attack occurs? So this is a great study. It's a meta-analysis. So they took four smaller studies and that were very similar in design, combined them to get a more powerful statistical result. And the question in this study was this, how bad is the blockage just before the heart attack occurs? So they got a bunch of people to volunteer to get a heart catheterization done every two, three, four years. And finally, when enough of them would come back in with a heart attack and they looked back to see how bad that previous blockage was, they had enough information for uh, to publish a study. And what they found was 68% of the time, the blockage that was causing the heart attack was 50% or less. 86% of the time, the blockage that was causing the heart attack was 70% or less. So only 14% of the time was the blockage that was causing the heart attack bad enough to uh, result in a positive stress test. The blockage has got to be about 70% before a stress test is gonna become abnormal. 86% of the time, the blockage that caused the heart attack was so mild that a stress test would never pick it up. So uh, Dr. Dean Berman, who's one of the developers of the radionuclear stress test, like a cardiolite or thallium stress test, understood this when he said 20 years ago that patients who have normal imaging stress tests frequently have extensive atherosclerosis. What he meant by that was the flow through the artery on this axis has to only starts to drop off when the blockage gets to be about 65 to 70%. So there, what he said was, uh, a lot of people who have normal imaging stress tests frequently have 20, 30, 40, 50, 60% blockages that the stress test will never pick up. 
So two thirds of the time, the blockage that results in a heart attack narrows the arterial lumen less than 50% over here, okay? What, it's not the blockage that causes the heart attack, it's the blood clot that forms when this thin fibrous cap ruptures and your body tries to heal it. And that blood clot then plugs up the entire artery and causes the heart attack or stroke. So how does the standard of care estimate your risk? Well, we rely on something called the Framingham Risk Score or a cousin of it. There are many more risk scores out there now that are all based on a Framingham type uh, uh, risk. And uh, they're looking at, it's based, on a, it's based on a study started in Framingham, Massachusetts back in 1948, a little town of 5,200 people. Doctors from Boston went over there and did a history and physical, did blood work, did an EKG on every man, woman, and child in town, came back and did it every year until finally about 10 years down the road, they had enough information. They could look at their statistics and found out that, yeah, it's high blood pressure. Those people are having more heart attacks. People with high cholesterol are having more heart attacks. Smokers are having more heart attacks. And so this assumes when you use this risk score, this assumes that you are the, the mean of some large bell-shaped um, curve. And you're not the mean of some large population group. You're your own group of one. And to treat you as an individual, we, we really need to know more about you, including something about your genetics. And so we want to know about, you know, if you have two or three different genes that put you at increased risk for cardiovascular disease, uh, there's a gene that we look at to see how you metabolize lipids, fats in your blood, because not everybody does it the same. And that's important for our picking a diet for you, uh, because not all diets are going to work for all people. And then we also need to, uh, there are genes that we need to know about because it, it they reflect how you respond to infections. And so if you listen to uh, Dr. Barb McClatchy's talk, my wife's talk uh, that she did uh, about a month ago, uh, she talked about that oral systemic connection and how your individual response to those inf infections can uh, play a role in your development of heart disease. And so that's why we practice together because it's, we really need to know all about these different root causes that can, that can play a role in both uh, uh, oral disease as well as cardiovascular disease. So then the next question is, how reliable is that Framingham risk score? Well, a doctor did a great little retrospective study. He said 222 people who came in with heart attacks and they were uh, people coming in prematurely. So as I said before, the average age for a man for a heart attack is 65. In this study, the men were less than 55. Uh, the average age for a woman for a heart attack is 72. In this study, they were 65 or less. And then after they came into the emergency room going, I definitely have arterial disease, I'm having a heart attack. Uh, he applied this Framingham type risk score and found out that it missed 82% of the women and 66% of the men. So these risk scores are not very reliable and still the standard of care says, you know, guidelines handed down by the American College of Cardiology and American Heart Association says, do a Framingham style risk score and see what their risk is. So that, that's not a very good way to estimate your risk if we're missing that many people. So we're gonna try detecting subclinical carotid or coronary artery tube coronary artery disease to find quote unquote healthy people who are at increased risk if we find evidence of disease there. And that can certainly change how we're going to treat you. You know, if the Framingham risk score says you've got a two, three, four percent risk of having a problem, your doctor's probably going to tell you you're doing great and let you go. But if we find evidence of having disease, that's a totally different picture. So we need to look for disease. We know we can't use a stress test because it's often wrong for various reasons. We can do a heart catheterization on you. Well, that's invasive, there's risk of complications associated with it. And really the problem with both of these approaches is they're just looking for blockages that are bad enough to need fixing. They're looking for blockages that would require a stent or bypass surgery. They're not really looking for mild asymptomatic disease. So let's look somewhere else. Well, we can look in the carotid artery. It's right under the skin. It's right in your neck right here. It's easy to image. Um, and the anatomy is that there's the common carotid artery down here. It branches just, just below the angle of your jaw here into the external carotid artery, which goes up to the muscles of your face. Internal carotid artery then goes on up to your brain. And so we're gonna use a, an ultrasound scan. It's called the carotid intima, thickness, uh, intima media thickness test. Uh, and it's just a simple 
15 or 20 minute ultrasound. There's no needles, there's no contrast involved. It's safe, it's non-invasive, it's reliable, repeatable. The American Heart Association said all this uh, 20 years ago. And still insurance does not pay for this test in this country. It's pretty, it's pretty inexpensive, but it's, it's just silly that things are that far behind. So again, the CIMT is looking at the arterial lining. It's not looking at the flow. You remember the stress test that we talked about is totally dependent upon the flow through the artery. We're not going to look at the flow. We're going to look at what's going on in the lining of your blood vessel. And so here's what it looks like. Here's a, in this picture, your feet are going to be down this way, your head's up this way. Here's the common carotid artery coming up your neck. At this line, it's widening out into what we call the carotid bulb, just before it branches right here into the external and internal carotid arteries. And we're going to look at two things. How thick is this lining layer down here in the common carotid artery? And there's a normal for age. It gets thicker as we get older. It's a little thicker in men than women. But if it's thicker than it should be, that's telling us that there's some cholesterol and inflammation building up in there. It's not plaque yet. The definition of plaque is a 1.3 millimeter thickness. And if you follow this lining layer out here farther, you can see it gets thicker out here. And this is definitely some soft uh, plaque out here in this artery. Here's another example of some soft plaque in a different artery. And so the question is then, what does finding that mild asymptomatic blockage mean? We know that 86% of the time is those, soft, those milder blockages that are going to cause trouble. So let's look at that. So here's a study where they took 10,000 healthy people. Nobody had high blood pressure, diabetes, or cholesterol. They were, there were men and women in the study, ages 35 to 65 years old. Everybody got a baseline carotid and femoral artery scan. Nobody got any treatment for 10 years because this was a natural history study. They wanted to see what happens if we don't treat arterial disease. So the average Framingham risk score uh, the risk for the 35-year-old men and women would be about 1.5%. The 65-year-old women would be about 5%. The 65-year-old men, 10%. The average Framingham risk in this entire group was about 3, 4, 5%. And here's the baseline pictures they got. There were almost 8,000 people who had normal arteries. There were 930 people that had thickening of the lining, but not plaque. There was another smaller group, 611, who had plaque, even though surprisingly, it was surprising because they did not have high blood pressure, diabetes, or cholesterol. And there was a small group that had what they called stenotic plaque in this group, which was a 50% or more blockage. So what happened? So now we're going to follow these people for 10 years. Nobody gets any treatment. And here's what we see. If you had no blockages, you had normal arteries, nothing happens to you. One person out of 8,000 had an event. If you had thickening of the lining, but not plaque, now the risk goes up to almost 9%. So you remember that was a 3.3 to 5% risk in entire groups, so it doubled or tripled your risk of having an event. And if we found plaque in somebody who had, uh, who had no high blood pressure, diabetes, or cholesterol, then it was a 40% event rate, not three, four, five percent or even take the worst case, it was if they were all men in this group uh, that were 65 years old, they would have a 10% risk, but no, it went up to a 40% risk. So now that we have found uh, mild asymptomatic disease, what are we going to do? How are we going to treat that? Well, we know it's inflammation that drives that whole arterial disease process. It's inflammation that plays a key role in the development of the plaques and the progression of the atherosclerotic disease. It's inflammation that destabilizes those plaques and promotes blood clot formation and, and plaque rupture. And so the next question, obviously, is are my arteries inflamed? And we have uh, several tests that we do on our patients routinely uh, to look and see if their arteries are, are inflamed. And if they are, we're going to get on that. Uh, so by finding root causes, what the whole bunch of things that can drive the whole inflammation process um, and optimally treating them, we can get that inflammation, that fire in the arterial wall to resolve. And so here are all the root causes that we look at, things like obstructive sleep apnea, low vitamin D, and inflammatory diseases, autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis and Sjogren's disease, uh, lupus, uh, people, insulin resistance. I told you, you know, 100 million people in this country are insulin resistant and don't even know it. Um, and then there's the, the, uh, the dental problems, the periodontal disease and endodontic disease. And that's why my wife and I are practicing together because while I'm responsible for all these things, she's responsible for finding and treating these because I can't do it. Um, that's not what I was trained in. Um, and then if we find all these things, treat them all optimally, then everything goes back towards normal. If you've got soft plaque in your artery, it shrinks down and calcifies and stabilizes. If you just have a thickened lining that's inflamed, it, that can go back towards normal and it can go back to being a normal lining. So we can actually stop the process and reverse it. 
And so there was a, a great study that came out in uh, circulation, American Heart Association Journal back in uh, 2013, that said there's a direct connection between oral pathogens, the bacteria in your mouth, both periodontal and endodontic, that's root canal lesions, and acute heart attacks. Um, so how are we going to treat all this? Well, lifestyle modification is the cornerstone of therapy. We cannot out-prescribe lifestyle. Okay, that's the, that's the most important thing I have to get my patients to do is, is make some changes in their lifestyle to help get that inflammation down. We want you to uh, help take healthy back. So here's the American Heart Association, seven essentials for heart health, and they're all very reasonable. It's uh, have, not smoking, it's having a BMI under 25. BMI is body mass index. If you don't know what yours is, it's based on your height and your weight, and you can Google how to get what the calculation comes out to. A normal BMI is, is 19 to 25. Over 25 is considered, over 25 to 30 is considered overweight, and over 30 is considered obese. Uh, 150 minutes of moderate or 75 minutes of vigorous exercise per week, a total cholesterol under 200, blood pressure under 120 over 80, fasting blood sugar under 100, and then diet. And at least four of these, so getting more fish in your diet, cutting back on red meat, increase uh, fiber and, and uh, whole grains in your diet. And this is the one that I think people have the most trouble with and one of the more important things, and that's that four one half cups uh, servings a day of fruit and vegetables. And you know, if you ask most people, well, are you getting that? Well, yeah, for lunch, I had a, I had a salad for lunch and it had you know, a couple of carrot strips in it and there was a couple of slices of tomato and a slice of cucumber. And for dinner, I had broccoli. Well, you know, that's, that's, just, that's just not adequate. You're not getting what you need. And so we strongly encourage our patients to uh, use a Juice Plus enhanced diet. Uh, Juice Plus is just um, you know, freeze-dried fruits and vegetables. They're vine ripened. Uh, you know, today, part of the problem with, with our fruits and vegetables is they've lost a lot of their nu nutrient content. Um, compared to uh, 30, 40, 50 years ago, uh, there's been a loss of a lot of nutrition from the, because of a uh, loss of uh, the fertility of the soil, uh, because things are not picked by and ripened. We get our fruits and vegetables from all over the country, all over the world now. Uh, so they have to be picked before they're ripe so that they can survive the trip to wherever you live to get them. Um, so it's really more like seven to 13 servings of fruits and vegetables you need a day. Um, there's, you know, the quality of the food is decreasing. There's, you know, trans fats, there's pesticides, GMO, synthetic vitamins, there's artificial coloring, growth hormones, um, antibiotics in the food. Uh, so it's harder to get a good quality food. And it's so important for us because fruits and vegetables is where we get our antioxidants from. And while we are, um, so what are antioxidants? Antioxidants are things that can com uh, combat the uh, free radicals that are occurring or we're putting in our body all day long while we're just, you know, we're just living and metabolizing everything we do. We're creating oxidative stress for our body. What that means is free radicals are molecules that have lost one or two electrons and they become very reactive. Um, and so the anti antioxidants are uh, molecules that have an extra electron or two to give up and can stabilize those free radicals. And those free radicals, when they're floating around, they react with all sorts of things, including your DNA, and it can play a role in aging. Um, so Juice Plus for us is, uh, we highly recommend it to all of our patients because it gets them 30 uh, fresh fruits and vegetables every day. And it's, it's easy to take, it's not expensive, and it's, it's a great way to make sure that you're getting that, that one of those important uh, parts of that lifestyle modification. There's hundreds and hundreds of phytonutrients in fruits and vegetables as opposed to just taking a multivitamin, which by the way, taking multivitamins has no beneficial effect to cardiovascular disease. It'll decrease your risk of cancer a little bit, but uh, you may get six, eight, 10 vitamins in a multivitamin, but nothing like the, the nutrients you get out of fresh fruits and vegetables. And the real reason we back, we back fruit uh, juice plus in our practice is because there are over, there are 39 randomized placebo controlled double blind studies done in major universities all over the world uh, published in oops sorry published in um, peer-reviewed uh, journals like you know like jack which is my my journal that's the american college of cardiology journal but you know clinical journal periodontology and nutrition research and all these peer-reviewed journals which say that juice plus is beneficial in a multitude of ways. And for me, it improves cardiovascular wellness, it decreases inflammation, improves the immune system, 
keeps you from getting attacking your DNA. Um, for my wife, for Barb, it improves gum tissue. It decreases bleeding. It decreases pocket depth. You don't have the some place for those bacteria to grow in your mouth, it improves insulin resistance and uh, decreased abdominal fat mass, which is a, a risk for uh, cardiovascular disease. Uh, so we love Juice Plus. And just a couple examples of uh, some, uh, some Juice Plus articles, uh, studies that say is uh, beneficial for you. This first one was published in the British Journal of Nutrition, which is talking about um, giving uh, people um, Juice Plus for eight weeks um, and then uh, looking at measures of oxidative stress, and that's the carboxy uh, proteins and oxidative LDL, oxidized LDL. That's the LDL that's reactive and gets into the intima and causes trouble. Uh, TNF alpha, that's a, a tumor necrosis factor alpha, interleukin 6. These are both um, inflammatory cytokines. Cytokines are little signaling proteins that. Uh, tell your body to do something. In this case, it's telling your body to mount an inflammatory response. And they also looked at the capillary blood flow before and after Juice Plus um, and with and without exercise. And what they found was taking Juice Plus decreased oxidative stress, it decreased these carboxy proteins, it decreased oxidized LDL, decreased tumor ne uh, necrosis factor alpha, and improved blood flow. Exercise and Juice Plus together um, independently each also improved capillary circulation. So it, it does all the right things for inflammation and for oxidative stress. This other article is, uh, uh, was published in the Journal of American College of Cardiology, talking about the effect of Juice Plus on, now it gets a little complicated, but I'm gonna explain it to you, okay? Impaired uh, impairment of flow mediated brachial artery vasoactivity. So here's what they're talking about. We know that you're, if you eat a high fat meal, it's going to decrease your artery's ability to constrict and relax for the next four hours. And so what they did in this study was they took a bunch of people and put half of them on Juice Plus, half of them on placebo, and they looked at this flow-mediated brachial artery dilatation. This, this is a simple test where they just put a blood pressure cuff on your arm, leave it blown up for a while, let the blood pressure cuff down, and they look at what's called the hyperemia, which means the increased response of your blood vessels to having been hypoxic for a little while, for having not gotten enough blood flow for a while. And so your body over responds to that and that's measured just by using an ultrasound And so what they found was this flow mediated brachial artery dilatation Measured before and after that a meal showed that juice plus blunted the high fat meals ability to block that vasoreactivity So this is a measure of endothelial function because as you men remember I mentioned at the beginning that the endothelium produces nitric oxide, which is what makes your blood vessels react uh, re dilate and, and um, get larger. So, uh, so Juice Plus helps with endothelial um, function. That's, that's huge. Uh, so this is, all these things are important parts of lifestyle. It's really the most important thing I, I uh, counsel my patients on is lifestyle. So what do you look like the day before you have a heart attack or a stroke? Well, you know, you don't plan that you're going to have a heart attack or stroke. Nobody wakes up in the morning and says, I'm going to have a heart attack today. I better be looking good because I'm going to the hospital. No, you're just doing your usual daily activities. You're with your friends and family. You're shopping. You're walking the dog. You're enjoying, you're enjoying life. If you were David Letterman, you were uh, getting ready to record the next uh, show of the Tonight Show. If you were James Gandolfini, you were working on the next episode of Sopranos. John Candy was probably planning his next big movie. Uh, Bob Harper... Uh, was exercising in the gym. He was riding on an exercise bike and fell over dead and got resuscitated by two family practice doctors who have to be in the gym at the same time. And John Warner, as you recall, uh, dropped dead from a heart attack in his hotel room, got resuscitated by his daughter and a couple of, uh, and, and a uh, pediatric cardiologist who was down the hall. And I think the most important, uh, the most important thing about John uh, Warner's a story is that after he recovered from his heart attack and he was giving interviews to all the major news outlets, CBS, NBC, uh, CNN, uh, he said that he knew that he was preordained or destined to have a heart attack because when he, uh, when he, his first child was born, uh, he looked around the room at all of his family members who were there to welcome his first child into the, into the world, and he noticed that there was not a single male member from his side of the family over the age of 60. So he thought that he was destined to have a heart attack. Unfortunately, what he didn't know is that heart attacks are optional. So, and here's, a, here's another classic example, uh, Tim Russert, who you all probably remember from the NBC um, uh, Sunday morning 
uh, political talk show, Meet the Press. He had high blood pressure and high cholesterol. He was being treated for both of them, and it was that standard of care goal for both of these. He was on an 81 milligram aspirin appropriately, and he had just passed a normal stress test. And now you know that if you pass a stress test, all that tells you is you don't have a blockage at 70% or more. You can have one of those milder blockages, and, and so many times that milder blockage is what causes the heart attack or, uh, the heart attack or stroke. Then, after passing a normal stress test with flying colors, he dropped dead of a heart attack at the NBC studios just eight weeks later. He was only 58 years old. So what's our take home today? What did you learn? Inflammation is what drives the arterial disease process. The key to prevention of arterial disease is finding mild asymptomatic disease rather than waiting until you have symptoms or an abnormal stress test. Working with a complete health dentist like my wife, Dr. McClatchy, who understands the oral systemic connection is paramount to finding all the sources of inflammation to optimally treat. And lifestyle modification is huge in what we do. And that includes a juice plus enhanced diet, uh, which is critical to decreasing inflammation and oxidative stress to help slow, stop, and even reverse the arterial disease process and thus prevent heart attacks and strokes. And so, um, now you know heart attacks are optional, and if you know that, then you know what my and you know what my Angelou says, which is do the best you can until you know better. Then when you know better, do better. So please join us on our mission to help knock cardiovascular disease off that top rung as the leading killer in this country. And uh, please contact the person who gave you the link to this video uh, so you can learn more about Juice Plus. Thank you so much for empowering us with incredible education, Dr. Golder. We would like to encourage you to get back with the person who invited you to watch this webinar to learn more. Thank you all so much for joining us.